Worship doesn't begin with the first note on a Sunday morning. It doesn't begin the moment our hands are raised. It begins the moment we make Jesus Lord of our lives and decide to begin a loving relationship with him with everything that we are. The moment we decide to make that connection. Back into worship we go. Last week we asked the question, who worships? And we clearly define through God's word that all creation worships God. All creation, all creation, everything created to worship our creator. And and we are a part of that, a big part of that. And in fact, I would say the largest part of that. We have a heart and an actual voice in in our lives to give back to him. So, So you, you are part of that. Every single one of you are a part of that. Now, that may look different from person to person, Christian to Christian, church to church. I've been in worship services that were, 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 last week was different, wasn't it? Yeah, I finally recovered about Tuesday. I'm serious. It was just different. Boy, it was awesome, though. I just loved it, but, but it was different. You know, we came out, and we came out to me, and, you know, instead of what we had this morning, and, and we're used to what we have this morning, kind of kicking things off and setting that tone, and boy, it was just, it just took a little bit, didn't it? Now, I can tell it took a little bit, about 10 minutes, in fact. I kind of watched, and some of, some of you were still just kind of, you know, just like me up here. But then everybody kind of got in and we just got to that place of worship. Some people are, are, are quiet with their worship. Some people are loud and exuberant with their worship. Some people would prefer to kneel. Some people would prefer to stand. Some people raise their hands. Some people don't. Some people sing loud music and some people sing in silence. But it's, it, it's all worship. As long as it comes from here. True worship begins in our heart. True worship begins inside of each and every one of us. We're all called to worship. This morning, I want to go just a little bit farther into the thought and the concept of what is worship. What is worship? And as I said last week and alluded to there just a little bit, we, we've made this. Anytime we, we, we mention that word worship, we make it about music. We make it about style, and uh, one of the, one of the questions I hate getting asked more than anything, and I've, I I can't tell you how many times. What kind of church you got? Is it contemporary or traditional? I just got a church that loves Jesus. Sometimes it'll look a little traditional. Most of the time, it looks a little contemporary. We just love Jesus. I just, I, I just get so caught up in that people, and, and that's how I know that people get caught up making worship about a style. This and that, and oh, it just, it just, oh, it gets me. Or they make it about, you know, colors, white or black or gray or this or that or lights or screens or books or what, whatever. And it's just, for some reason, culture and society has just caused us Even as Christians and people that go to church all the time, that's just what we think about. And as your pastor and as your friend this morning, if there's even an inkling of that inside of your mind and your heart, I just want to ask you and challenge you at this particular point in time in your life to get it out. Get it out. Because I can promise you this, just across Highway 5 at the Assembly of God Church this morning, they are worshiping God. In some ways it looks similar, but in some ways it's completely different. But I know this, they're worshiping the same Jesus we are. Across, the, across town over at Ava General Baptist Church, I just watched a short little clip of Pastor Oren preaching this morning. Guess what? Worshiping the same God. He's preaching about the same Jesus. It's the same thing. It's not about style. It's not about a building. It's not about colors and music and this and that. It is about a God that is alive and desires a relationship with each and every one of us. So... End all that religiosity, traditionalistic thinking that it has to be this way. That was bold. Get over it. In fact, I had a wonderful conversation with Orrin, who is still one of my mentors today, many years ago. And we got into the topic and the concept of worship and what is church supposed to look like? Because we get all these thoughts and ideas that church has to look this way and we have to do this and we have to do this. And, and he, I sit across from him one day and just listening to him pour into my life. And he said, Ron, I've studied this Bible from front to back, in between, in, out, out to in, multiple times. And I can't find anything that tells me exactly what that's supposed to look like. 
Man, that, that, that spoke to me in a big way. Why? Because Orrin and I are completely different. I mean, I don't even have to say anything else. But you know what I know? And, and, and I say that respectfully. Why? Because I'm just fine with who God made me to be, and Orrin's just fine with who God made him to be. And we have chosen to use that, and that's not about style. It's nothing about any of that stuff. It's just about Jesus and loving on people. So, Orrin, if you get to watch this this week, I love you. I do. We can be different, and it's okay. Worship can be different, and it's, it, it's, it's okay. Another element which people judge or say is worship or isn't worship, and, and I saw this a lot, and I will just be frankly honest. A church isn't worshiping, some say, some Christians say, unless they're raising their hands or they're jumping and shouting or this is happening or that is happening. I can't tell you the amount of times. Oh, we had a great worship service, and it was gauged by the fact that the altars were full or everyone's hands were raised. And then somehow that gets into our mindset that when that doesn't happen, that God's not moving in people's lives. But I can't tell you the times that I've walked out of a service thinking, God, did I just really connect with anyone or not? To have to be stopped or to get a call or to get a message, or to get a text that just simply says, Pastor Ron, that just spoke. God moved in my life this morning. Now let me just say this as a caveat and kind of a soapbox, if you will. <laughs> worship is not about being comfortable. There's nothing comfortable about worship. There's not. It's challenging. Worship draws us into something different. It draws us into the unexpected. It draws us a step farther into that relationship with God. There's something freeing about this. Am I telling you you have to do this to worship God? No, I don't. But there is something freeing. There's something really freeing about this. When you humble yourself before, because this is what happens. When, when it, and we're going to talk about the external here in just a little bit. But when we get to the place to where this doesn't matter, then we're not concerned about other people around us. And we're not concerned about, you know, Curly sitting over here on this side or Dan sitting here, or James sitting here, or Wade sitting here, or wherever. We, we, we stopped worrying about who else is in this room because in all honesty, it doesn't really matter in that moment who else is in this room but you and God. Or whatever other room that you're in. So if it's this or knelt, if it's jumps and shouts, and, or, or, or if it's tears and, and maybe moans of anguish, it's still worship. It's still that connection with God. I could go on and on about the different things people say worship is. And all of this is, they're wonderful expressions, but that is not worship. Worship comes from here. I want to share a scripture with you. That, that in the New Testament is, 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 is read in a couple different places, and it's read similarly. But this is the one that I always go back to, and, 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 and this is one that when I read it, and, and, and because it's the, it's the greatest commandment that, that Jesus gave us to follow. And, and to me, when I read this scripture, this is worship. And it comes out of the book of Mark. It's in chapter 12, verse 30. And it says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength. We say, well, that scripture is about loving God. Isn't that what worship really is anyway? To me, that is the, if, if you could pick, and there are a ton of wonderful, amazing worship scriptures in the Bible. But if I'm picking one, it's this one. And just, just leave that up there for just a second. I'm, I'm picking this one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Everyone say all. all. I preached a series on that word one time because that encompasses everything. It's not just pieces and parts. It's, it's everything, and it's the same thing with our worship. 
Worship is not just about style. It's not just about the building. It's not just about a hymn book. It's not just about a screen and lights. It, it, it's, it's not anything. It, 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 it's, it, it's everything encompassing leading back to the true heart, which is to, to connect with God himself. Now, I, want you, I was in here this morning preparing. I've never, and this is the very first time this has ever come out of my mouth. I love when God shows me new things out of Scripture. Amen? Don't you just love that? That's why the Bible is so relevant today. Because you can read one particular verse a thousand times in your lifetime, and God can speak something different to you all of the time. So, so let's look at this verse in context just really. I just want to share what God spoke to me today and, and think about this. Love the God, Lord your God with all of your heart. Let's stop right there for just a second. When, when, when we mention the word heart, we think of love immediately, right? Love. We think of emotions. We think of feelings that, that, that come from inside of us. Now, a true heart is so much more than that, but just stay with me, all right? Appease me here. Just love. love the Lord your God with all of your heart. That's emotional. I, I'm just going to be real, you know, just stone cold this. I'm not saying you can't worship like this. But if I'm loving God with all of my heart, there is some emotion in that. People say, well, you're not supposed to be emotional in worship. Really? Because I have to believe in the way that I read my Bible, we have an emotional God. Jesus showed tons of emotion. Did he not? I mean, the man wept because he was brokenhearted. Okay? We know in certain instances that, that he had a good time. I mean, his very, very first miracle, he was at a wedding reception, turned water into wine. I mean, I have to think that Jesus didn't just walk in all stoic. It was a party. People were having a good time. Somebody got married. It was a, it was a, it was a big deal. He showed anger. Now, he controlled his anger. That's a whole other message. But did he not show that when he walked into the temple and he turned over the tables of the money changers? And he said, How, what have you turned my daddy's house into? There, there was that, emo, there's some emotion that comes with that. And, and so in your worship, people say, well, I don't want to show any emotion. Why don't you want to show emotion? Why are we so afraid to allow that to happen? Why are we so afraid to smile and jump and dance and shout and sing? Why are we afraid to become vulnerable and show tears? Do we think that that's weakness? That's not weakness, that's life. I'm preaching good this morning, so just come on. With all your soul, with all your soul, that tells me that worship has to be spiritual, has to be spiritual. There has to be that, that place to where it's not about me and it's not about everything external. It is about a spiritual moment with the living God, allowing the Holy Spirit who is spiritual to come in and consume my life, consume this moment, consume, I mean, in, in completely spiritual with all your mind. That also tells me it's intellectual. It, it, you know, now, the mind is a crazy place. And a lot of crazy things happen in your mind. A lot of wars and battles go on in your mind. Satan can get in here and he can mess things up. You have to win that battle. Because how many of you know this? If you come in and your mind's all whacked out, Something's going on and you got this thought and you got this struggle and Satan's just pounding you. What's the last thing you want to do? Worship. True worship. You have got to control that. You've got to get and just recognizing to make it better. No, does it make the problem go away? No, but God has control of my mind. He has to have control of my mind. So we have got to get, you know, it is intellectual because it is a battle. This is the one I really like. And with all your strength. What is strength if it's not used? Adam can have the biggest muscles in the world, and he does have the biggest ones in this church. <laughs> Guns. But if they're not used, if it's not used, you can have all the strength in the world, but if that strength is not used, what good does it really do? Worship isn't a physical thing. Worship is an action thing. It is a doing thing. God does his part. We have to do ours. We have to, to show that and put that strength, that physical nature of worship into action. 
I love this quote by Darlene Jeck. I've used this for years. It came from a book that she wrote many, many years ago. And, and she was the one who wrote, remember the old song, Shout to the Lord, we sang it last week? Remember that? Darlene wrote that. She was the leader of, of Hillsong when, when the whole Hillsong movement kind of began. And, 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 and she wrote this book um, called Extravagant Worship. And, and this was a, a, a definition that she gave. The essence of worship is when your heart and soul and all that is within you adores and connects with the Spirit of God. Now, the reality of this, and what I really love about this, you could leave this up too, is with all that heart and soul, everything, all, that's that word again, adores. There's that, you know, adoration. There's that love for God. There's that love for his presence and love for his spirit and love for him to move and love for those goosebumps and all of that amazing thing. That has to be a part of that. But the, the, the big word in this whole definition is the word and. Because connects, that's, that's, an, that's an acting, that's a doing, that's something physical that has to happen. You can take, you know, case in point. I don't know what this will do, it may pop. This does absolutely zero good like this. You will not hear Rick's bass playing like this. We can stand there and see that, well, if I would plug this into this, then this happens. And one of them by itself is very pointless. This one holds the power. This holds everything in the world to make this work the way that it's supposed to. This will preach. Anybody here? This holds that power. And if this stays unplugged, it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to hear it. At least not hear it the way you're supposed to. But the moment you plug it in, it all changes. And it's the same thing with your relationship and your worship with God. If you don't connect it and plug it in, it's never going to be what it was intended to be. That just came out. That was good. I hope your bass works, Rick. <clears throat> worship doesn't begin with the first note on a Sunday morning. It doesn't begin the moment our hands are raised. It begins the moment we make Jesus Lord of our lives and decide to begin a loving relationship with him with everything that we are. The moment we decide to make that connection. It's to be full of adoration and love for God and then act. It's a doing thing. It requires action. And it involves our heart, our minds, and our soul, and our strength. And it's expected by God. It is expected we were created to worship. I want to go back to a verse that we used um, back in our last series, and we looked in that, that whole, you know, different series. Remember that series? We looked in 1 Peter. Well, I'm going to go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And it says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. We are this to do this. God, God made me who I am to praise him. How he made me to praise him. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore I uh, uh, urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. It says nothing about anything that happens here. It's about our lives. It's about what, what comes from inside, going outside of each and every one of us. It's our spiritual act of worship. So then that leads me to the question, how are you worshiping? How am I worshiping? I mean, how are we worshiping, church? How? Is, 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 it, is that really my life? Am I offering myself in that way? Wherever that may be, in whatever circumstance and situation. Do you worship at work? Do you worship at work? I mean, and think about it. Take music out of the equation. Take your CD player and Pandora and Spotify completely away from everything that you have. Do you worship at work? Is your life lived in that way that it, it, it shows and it exhibits worship? Can people tell it? Can people see it? Are you taking advantage of those opportunities or just getting through the day? 
Honest question. Even for me. Even for me, I check myself all the time because now in my life it's not. Man, I was, you know, I just did pastoral occupational ministry for years. Years. It's what, I mean, it was, I, I love it. But I shared with my team this morning, and, and you know, over this last year, you know, I accepted this, this call into, a, you know, a whole other world. Let's just put it that way. But I had to claim it. Otherwise, I'm just going to a job and drawing a paycheck. Which, by the way, in ministry, if that's all you're doing, we're failing. We're failing. I want to worship at my job. I want to worship here as, a, as your leader, as your pastor. I want to worship when I play, but I want to worship when I work too. I, I want to be that, that, that says, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And I'm crazy enough to do it. I was reminded of something this week. When, remember Brother John Nelson's wife? You, you, anybody here remember John? I see Vernon nodding his head. Oh my gosh, man of God. I've told this story before, and I believe John had a gift. He was an older gentleman, and man, he could preach. He preached a house down. But I believe he had a gift that God would speak through him. I, I do. And I'll never forget as long as I live, I was going through a time in my life and a period in my life where I was struggling and trying to figure out what I was going to do. And, you know, I wanted to go to school. I was wanting to go to school, back to school so bad and get my degree and, and teach and coach. And, and I was just battling with all of this stuff. And, you know, but at the same time, I just felt this draw into ministry and a draw into music. And, and it was kind of crazy because all I could do at this particular point in time was sing. That's all I could do. I couldn't play squat. And this would have been... 1990, end of 98, early 1999. <clears throat> and I was sitting in the back row of a service. The service was fantastic. Worship was great. We was at the assembly over here. The very back row. And uh, he preached and it was great. And then, and then he just allowed himself through that moment to just kind of let God use him and to speak into people's lives and to pray over them. And, you know, a few people kind of, you know, he talked to them and prayed with them and all this stuff. And I'm sitting on the back row trying to hide. Anybody ever been that in church? You're like, oh, I hope you don't call on me. Please don't call on me. And we're sitting there on that back row and, and he just, it, it, and it just goes silent. It's just like God just turned the light, you know, I like him right now. And, and Brother John looked back and he said, you back there in the back row. And you guys know the look, right? He said, no, you. And I, yes, he asked me my name. And I told him my name. And then he prayed. And then when he got done praying, he read my mail. And this is what he said. He said, son, he said, you're so worried about going to school. He said, you're so worried about what you think you're supposed to do next. He even called out coaching and teach I mean it was specific it's like he got God on the phone he said son he said you just need to sit back and let God do what he wants to do in your life because you're exactly where he wants you to be right now I wanted to crawl under the but I didn't I got up and I just started worshiping and from that moment forward I couldn't play I couldn't play squat I said, okay, God, if I'm going to do this, you're going to have to help me. And things just began to happen. It wasn't too much longer after that that his wife came and spoke over me and my wife and made this statement. Said, I see in your lives a lot of 90-degree turns. For most people, they're scary. But she said, for you guys, you'll do it. Why? Why? Because I truly want to do what God wants me to do. It's the all thing. With all my heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. That's worship. It's being willing to, 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 to do what God wants you to do. To worship him exactly where you are in your life. It's your spiritual act of worship. Really quick. Just really quick. I want to share a couple things. In fact, the worship team, if you guys want to come on up, that, that'd be fantastic. 
I want to talk about two categories of worship this morning. The first is giving praise upward. Worship, giving, it's giving praise upward. It is that, you know, show of, of, of singing and playing and praying and shouting and dancing and singing and speaking praises to our Father. I mean, that, that is part of worship. It's, com- it's completely part of worship. Let's look at Psalms 150, one of the most beautiful, you know, chapters in the whole Bible. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Verse 2. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for, for His surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Here, look, this is external. This, this is that strength thing. This is that acting thing, the connecting thing. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Verse 4. Praise him with the tim- timbrel or the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. And verse 5. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding loud. That tells me, Wade, keep playing a lot loud and hard. Benji, you beat them things as loud as you can beat them. I'm serious. It's in the Bible. Praise. It's external. It is doing something. It's doing something. It's praising Him externally in our lives. It's amazing, by the way. That don't be fooled into worshiping the music or the style again, regardless of how awesome the music is, unless your heart's in it. And we're worshiping only the music. Praising upward also involves more than our talents and our abilities. It involves the giving of our time and our resources. Serving in the church is worship. Serving in your community is worship. Serving in WOW Kids is worship. It may be chaotic worship, but it's worship. Serving in the tech booth is worship. Shaking hands at the door, greeting people out front is worship. Making coffee and serving things, it is worship. Listen to me. Making food and and, and cooking it and making people smile. It is worship. It's worship. Serving is worship. If you ain't serving, just being bold again, you should be somewhere, somehow. Anyone can stand in the door and shake a hand, give somebody a hug and a smile and tell them good morning. Anybody. Anyone can go back there. You can learn. We've got great people back there that do this job every single Sunday. They can teach you. Anyone can go back here and love on kids. I promise you today, you walk up to Tate and Cindy and say, I want to serve. Man, they're giving you a hug and ain't letting go. Anybody. You can do it. Now, you may get back there after three or four weeks and decide, well, maybe I'm not called to children's ministry, but I'll go over and do this. You can make coffee. You can set up a kitchen for a Sunday morning. Anyone can go into the store and shake somebody's hand and give them a smile. And it may be the only smile and handshake they get all day or all week. That's serving. (coughs) Giving is also a part of worship. It's not just something I stand up here and blab out of my mouth every Sunday. It's a part of worship. Giving is worship. Definitely is worship. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each man should give what he has decided in his own heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And then what he says in verse 6, prior to this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Now I know that that verse, and we look at that verse about giving, but leave that up there for just a second. Let's think about this. Not changing anything, just, just think of the concept. Whoever sows sparingly with their worship to God will also reap sparingly. Whew, this will preach. But whoever sows generously in their worship will also reap generously. I'm not adding to, I'm not taking away. Just think about that. Think about the life. Think about the giving. Think about your worship. I've heard some people say, well, I'm not getting out of worship what they're getting out of worship. Are you giving into worship what they're giving into worship to receive what they're receiving? That's a bold question, but it's honesty. It's honesty. God wants us to give with the right attitude. So to do that, we must be, it must be treated as an act of worship. And remember, worship is about giving all of ourselves back to the one who first gave to us. Gifts, talents, time, resources, whatever it may be. The second thing, really quick, worship is receiving instructions from above. 
We think worship so many times is just all about this and all about me and all about my experience and all about this. But worship is just as much about stopping in the moment and letting God speak to me. If we miss that, then we miss everything. Sometimes we bolt right past it, the exciting and the flash and the outward expression. It's awesome, but the inward worship is what changes our life. It's what changes us. What happens inside of us is what changes us. Taking time for God to speak into your life. This is where you receive direction. This is where you receive instruction. It's where you receive discipline and grace and mercy and love. We take the time to love on God, but we don't allow God time to love on us. Proverbs 1.33 says, But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear or harm. Psalms 32 verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. But how will we learn? How will that counsel come if we don't stop to listen? How? How can we hear what God's trying to tell us and teach us if we don't stop long enough to let him speak? Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your, on your own understanding. And then it goes on to say, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. But the only way you're going to be able to lean on his is to stop long enough to let him speak. Stop long enough in your busy life, in my busy life, just to listen. Just to listen. What is worship? It's a lot of different things. I love to worship. I love to worship. I love to worship with you on a Sunday morning. I love it when the altars are full. I do. I love it when when hands all across this room are raised. But I love just as much seeing people using their gifts and talents and serving and loving and giving to others. It's worship. It's a spiritual act of worship. church we can't get so caught up in all of that that we don't stop long enough to listen to God to listen to God this morning we're going to worship for just a little bit we are going to use music as a part of that but I would want to challenge you today to connect plug in with the living God I would challenge you today with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength to allow yourself to go to that place. Maybe it's going to a place that you've never been before. Or maybe it's a place that you haven't been in a long time. But when you get there and you experience and you give and and that physical act of worship happens, I want to challenge you to stop listen just stop and listen because God may be wanting to share some amazing life changing 90 degree turns with you in your life maybe just maybe what he wants to speak to you today to somebody is just simply this I love the whole world so much. I loved you so much that I gave my son to die for you. And if you would just believe in me, you'll never perish, but you'll have eternal life. The gift of salvation, stepping into that relationship, honestly, it's that first step into 